grade 12, choice 1 and 2, 30th of July, first half hour. And just remember afterwards the word is like the half hour. Okay, going, going, going. So we've done this particular slide. I'm just going over it again just to make sure that you remember. So up until now, we have had an astralo, astralo, pathicus, aparensis, because it came from a faraway place. So remember that it came from East Africa. And it was the first in the line of the astrological beacons. And the main example that you had to look at, the first one that was found, was called Lucy, as it's common name. Okay. Then remember I said to you that if you've written a genus name out already, so I should have underlined that, if you've written a genus name out already, you're allowed to abbreviate it. So I'm going to call it AU, full stop, Africanus, and I'm calling it AU because before the Astralopithecans, there was this. Okay, so because this one came first, this gets the abbreviation A, normally, scientifically speaking, and Australopithecus africanus should get an AU if you've discussed Australopithecus before that. Do you need that full stop at the end of Africanus? Yes. Um, no. But you do need it at the end of AU. And you do need it to be underlined. You should be telling me to underline it, guys. Okay. Remember, first word is the genus, second word is the species. Genus name always starts with a capital letter. Species name always written in lowercase. Doesn't matter whether you write the whole scientific name, whether you write the genus name, whether you write the species name, you underline it. Okay, All right, so we spoke about that. Um, we spoke about the brow ridge, we spoke about the main finds, and so far, under Australopithecus Africanus, we have got Taung Chao as the very first one, but this was not a good example because it was just a skull and it was of a child, so it didn't give all the information that was needed. The next one was Mrs. Place from Sturkfontein, and then um, this one is a very interesting, very controversial find, but a very interesting story. And so the story goes, there was a professor, there is a professor, but I think he might have a time now, but anyway, he might be an emeritus, um, Professor Ron Clark, and in 1994, he was going through um, a box of um, foot bones, fossilized foot bones, from Sturkfontein Caves. And he found four little fossil bones that were clearly foot bones, but when he looked at them, he said um, that they fitted together, and he called the, little, the hominid from which they came, little foot, because they were tiny foot bones. Um, in 1997, he was looking through another box that they said was of monkey bones. And he found a leg bone. And he looked at it and he said, mm -mm, not, a, not a leg bone. Not a monkey bone, sorry. It's a leg bone, but it's not a monkey bone. And when he put it together with these little foot bones, it fitted perfectly. So he felt that they were from exactly the same specimen. But it wasn't an entire leg bone. It was um, just part of it. And what actually happened in that area is there were certain chemicals that were needed, I think it was lime, that were needed for extracting gold out of rock. And so there were a lot of um, 
in that area a lot of blasts where people used to just dynamite um, in the ground and then collect all the stone that came and then carve it off and go and use it. Um, and so a lot of fossils were sadly lost in that way. Anyway, I don't know, have you guys been to Stirpontan Caves? It's huge and it's dark. And it's huge and it's very dark. So Ron Clark goes to two of the workers that are working in Stirpontan Caves, looking for fossils and things. And he says, he has a leg bone, but it's only part of it. You can see it's been broken off here. Please find me the rest of this fossil. Now, Stirpontan Caves is enormous and the roof is high and it's really dark. Two days later, they found it. Okay, so what they found was they saw coming out of the rock towards them the broken off portion to which this little portion attached. So, I mean, it was the most incredible find because it was just tiny. And to find that in that whole big thing, it was just unbelievable. Um, Prof. Clark um, called his little foot. Originally, it was thought to be Australopithecus africanus. And Professor Clark spent a long time excavating it. So if you went down Stirpontan Caves for quite a long time, there was a little passage off to the side there that had a security gate and people were not allowed to go into there. And that was because little foot was being excavated there. Um, he has a lot of arguments which say it is not Australopithecus africanus. He feels that there are some differences between little foot and Australopithecus africanus. And so he has classified it as Australopithecus prometheus. But it's okay to call it either one. Okay, so here are the little foot bones that he found. Here is um, little foot trapped in the rock. Um, and this is Ron Clark. And I put this one in because there was once a question about how fossils are extracted from rock. And so what they use is they use tiny little drills, almost like a dentist drill, and paint brushes. And then they drill away the rock from around the fossils, but they've got to be very, very careful not to damage the fossil. And then they use a paintbrush to get rid of all the little rock particles. And here he's showing you what the hand looked like. So the hand was in this funny little, very uncomfortable position. And it looks as if um, it was actually killed in a rock fall. No, I have to put the slide of it how it actually lies. Anyway, so there we go. Um, these are the two gentlemen who uh, found the actual bone after just two days. Um, here are the actual leg bones after, this is the one that he had, and he's matching it up to the leg bone that they found sticking out of the rock after it had been excavated a little bit. It is thought that she looked like this. It's been identified as a female. Anyway, so that's Australopithecus, possibly Australopithecus Prometheus, no, lowercase. But there is some controversy about that. Okay, and that example is little. Okay. And then in 2008, this was the first, how old were you guys? Six. Six. Oh. Okay, 2008, Professor Lee Berger, who you know is an American, but he works at Fitz, um, discovered two almost complete skeletons of a young male and an adult female of um, something that was a possible transitional fossil 
between Australopithecus and Homo. Remember, this was the one where his son found the actual first parts of this. So what actually happened is Lee Berger was looking on Google Earth and he saw, he identified an area which had a different kind of vegetation to the surrounding vegetation. And so he said this vegetation that he was identifying was um, suitable for finding in an area where there were lots of fossils found in other places. So he went out there, he took his son, he took his dog, and he was searching around and his son, who was in primary school, said, um, Dad, isn't this a, a fossil? And sure enough. And so Lee Berger then carried on hunting around the area and he found two almost complete skeletons of this particular kind of organism. So this thing, um, where have I got the name? I haven't even got the name anywhere. Australopithecus sediba. Okay, Australopithecus sediba. And so, um, oh, there it is. It was um, dated at 1.9 million years ago, million years old shares more features with early Homo species than any, any other Australopithecus species. And so this is Australopithecus sediba. Okay, and the common name is Corral, of that first one that was found. Okay, um, it's a possible transitional species, Lee Berger has a very convincing argument for it to be a transitional species. Okay. Um, in the actual area, so because of the composition of the rock, there are lots of faults in the rock. He found it at Malatha, which is near Sturkmontain. So there are lots of faults. There are faults that lie this way, and there are also faults that lie this way. And because of the composition of the rock, what actually happens is water drips down these little cracks and it opens them up and they become bigger and bigger and bigger and they become what is called a death trap, death trap. And those then go down through the rock until they reach a grotto where water has eroded a big cavern underground. And what you can see is these little piles of um, sediment that have accumulated because water has dripped down, down, down and it carries minerals with it and then it forms these little piles like that. Um, this is where the actual skeletons were found at the bottom here and they were submerged in sediment. Okay, for a long time it was thought that it was during a time when there was very little water available and it was thought that this couple of Australopithecus sediba, not a couple as in a mating couple, but um, an adult female and a slightly younger male, that they had seen monkeys going down, climbing on vines, going down and getting water from the bottom here. And it was thought that they would be able to smell the water. And it was thought that maybe what they did was they tried to go down as well, but then it was, they were too heavy and they couldn't get back out again. And then they were washed down to the bottom here and submerged in sediment, their skeletons, and they just died inside. Later on, it was found that in fact, at that time, um, so there is some fossilized hyena poo from exactly the same period. So in this area they found some fossilized hyena feces and when breaking this down, they found a pollen grain of yellow wood, Photocopus henkeli. Those of you from the Cape who've been to the Nisner Forest know that those yellow wood trees are absolutely huge and they don't grow in, in dry conditions. And then it was thought, no, that in fact, the fact that there was pollen of um, this big yellow wood tree showed that it wasn't a time of actual 
lack of water. But anyway, so they haven't worked out how these things got down there. So there's Lee Burger, and here is Carabo, the little parts that were found of Carabo. So this is the adolescent male. Okay, so this is the, they always give them um, letters, and this was the first one, one, because uh, it was the first one that was found, and two, this is the second one that was found. Look, there's a nice scale down there, so you can work out how tall they were, etc., etc. And you can see a lot of the different bones were found, and the rest of the skeletons were not found. Okay, so here's a, a normal human hand, um, with the Australopithecus Cedeba sediba hand, with this being reconstruction, and this is putting it in a normal human hand so that you can see the difference in size. Okay, there's some skull fragments from it, there's some teeth to compare with some um, Homo sapiens teeth. Quite a small cranium. Not a very protruding jaw if you compare it with um, Australopithecus africanus and afarensis, the jaw doesn't protrude as much. And the teeth are not as big as those teeth. Okay. They didn't excavate the entire skull because they were scared that they were going to break it if they took the whole thing out. So they sent it off to, I think it was Germany, that did the scans and produced a three-dimensional picture of it. And then they think that that was what Australopithecus sediba looked like. So look, you can see certain things here heavy brow ridges, and so that gives you some information about the diet. You can also see a sloping back forehead, and that tells you that the frontal region of the brain was not very well developed, and big jaws, big jaws, quite big teeth when you see them this way. Okay, and so that tells you that the food that they ate was um, quite tough food and they had to chew a lot. Um, okay. Mm. What did you say the brow ridges were for here? Thanks for that. We'll go back to the actual brow ridge slide. There we go. You can read it while I'm getting into this ghastly thing. Okay. To reinforce the weaker bones of the face. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right. So, what are the features of Sediba, especially the features that make it fit in with Lieberger's argument that it's a transitional? Actually, had a very small brain size. So, 420 to 440. What was Australopithecus africanus? Almost four, 480, almost 500. Okay, and Australopithecus afarensis was smaller than that. Um, but interestingly, um, two halves of the brain not equal in size, and this is a characteristic of modern humans. Just over 1.2 meters, which makes it a little bit taller than Australopithecus africanus. Long arms, short, powerful hands. This means that it climbs trees. But the pelvis was unusually advanced. Okay. Very long legs, which is unusual for Australopithecans, and capable of running and walking like a human. So that was his argument why he felt it was a transitional uh, thing. Yeah. Mm. What makes the pelvis like advanced? Because it's short and wide. So what you'll see is in any organism that is quadrupedal, walks on four legs, the because the weight is not just on the hind limbs, in a quadrupedal organism, weight is on the forelimbs and the hind limbs, then the pelvic girdle doesn't have to be as um, robust. And so the pelvic girdle in quadrupedal and knuckle walkers is long and narrow. 
because when they walk, the weight is not on the pelvic girdle. So as soon as you get to a bipedal organism, the pelvic girdle is short and wide and bowl shaped to carry the weight of the body. Why did they, I've made it known that the brain's part of the different sides. They can, you can see from the inside of cranium. Is there like a little Oh, you, you can see. So what actually happens is inside the cranium, so they can do, um, there's a word for it, brain casts. Mm -hmm. So they can fill the inside with, say, um, you know, have you ever had a, a tooth thing you put in? No. It's a sort of latex rubber stuff that they put inside. And it takes on the shape of where the brain would have um, shown the inside. The inside of the skull shows the, what the brain looked like, the outside of the brain. So the outside of the, the inside of the skull is like a mold that forms as a result of the brain forming inside. So they then would be able to take that cast and know the exact shape of the brain. They could see that the left and the right were different sizes. Okay, right. So, again, please make sure that you are able to interpret this kind of diagram. Don't, don't learn it. Um, so, it just talks a little bit about some of the characteristics, which is why I included this. And it shows that Homo habilis, we'll talk about that, was the first... Um, along the hominid evolutionary line that developed tools. Okay? Right, and then the tools just got bigger and bigger, but we'll talk about that. So now we're going on to the genus Homo. Um, around about 2.5 million years ago, a new type of hominid evolved in Africa. Larger, more complex brains between 650 to 800 cubic centimeters. Smaller brow ridges. Okay, now this use of this word to describe the category of Australopithecans is not a genus name, and so it's not underlined, or it's not typed in italics, because it's describing a genus, okay, I mean a, a category, it's not describing the particular genus. They had flatter faces. And what does that tell you? That the, the whole protruding jaw thing is not as um, big as it has been up until now, and therefore the food that they ate was um, less tough. No sagittal crest. Remember I spoke yesterday about a sagittal crest being almost like a mohawk of bone across the top, that certain of the individuals in um, lower categories had and that was for the attachment of the big jaw muscles because the food was tough. Okay, so smaller teeth tells you they ate less plant material. Okay, so now we're going through the sequence of Homo. And so the first one was Homo habilis. Okay, and Homo habilis like the word habitat, okay, is referred to commonly as the handyman. It doesn't mean that this is a common name for the first fossil that was found. It is simply a common name for um, Homo habilis because they were the first ones that used tools. So it's like they built their own house fix their own house, that kind of thing is, is what the implication is. Um, fossils have been found um, round about, look, look at this, between, <sighs> sorry, 2.33 million years ago. Thought to be ancestral of mo to modern humans and it shows, the skulls show that there are portions of the brain associated with speech that were enlarged. And again, that is done by the brain casting thing. Okay, all right. 
So they might have had the ability to use speech sounds, not speech. Speech sounds, very different. Humans were the first one to have speech. And this could have led to things like hunting cooperatively, 